Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for your patience. And uh, certainly thanks for uh, some of you who are probably in some pretty rough weather right now out there on uh, our uh, remote sites. Uh, but anyway, thanks, thanks everybody. And uh, please drive safely. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Frank Schley, President of the Parkinson's Resource Center of Spokane. We welcome you. Uh, certainly everyone that's at all our remote sites and our uh, hometown folks here in Spokane, thank you for being here. Uh, as always, uh, just take a, a quick moment to thank all of our sponsors and supporters that make this happen. Uh, Northwest Telehealth, uh, Mark Harder uh, for producing today's program, and certainly uh, Lydia Wood and St. Luke's for providing uh, the facility and the support that we need here to make this happen. And all of you, of course, out there that are contributing uh, each and every day to uh, fund this uh, very much needed program. Also, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Northwest Parkinson's out of Seattle for partnering up with us and uh, for uh, their ongoing and long-term support of this important program. For Albertsons, for their uh, very generous uh, support for funding many programs, including telehealth. And of course, our uh, PRC Board of Directors and staff and last but not least, our volunteers who help make these uh, programs happen each and every month. Jackie Ewell, our uh, volunteer coordinator, and Walt Shirley, uh, Jacobowski for uh, supporting today. Good guys, good and as always, uh, we'll ask everybody to hold their questions till the end. And at the remote sites, if you'd please turn off your microphones for now. Uh, so everybody has a chance to uh, listen in to the speakers. So uh, it's a very special day today. I'm uh, very honored and pleased to um, uh, bring forward a couple of our very special guests. Uh, two products from Washington State University College of Pharmacy. And uh, they're both involved with Elder Services. Uh, one of our two speakers is uh, Josh or Joshua Newmiller. Dr. Newmiller specializes in the geriatrics with a focus on diabetes and also movement disorders. And uh, our own uh, Lindy Wood, Swain. <laughs> Remember, she got married recently. Uh, and uh, I want to say a few extra words about Lindy, if you don't mind, Lindy. I don't want to embarrass you or anything, but uh, uh, before they come up and talk. Uh, Lindy, uh, as I said, uh, also is a product of Washington State University College of Pharmacy here, a doctorate in pharmacy. She's uh, been involved with the uh, community, supporting the community, and certainly the Parkinson's Research Center of Spokane uh, with her expertise and focus on movement disorders and uh, geriatric diseases. Uh, she was our first student representative uh, from Washington State University on the PRC Board of Directors in July of 2008 when she joined us. And she's now in her third year on the board. Uh, over that time, uh, Lindy has provided significant contributions of time and certainly her many talents and has written several articles in our newsletters and spoken on uh, many other occasions across various topics. Uh, and you can look for a lot of the work that she is involved with and certainly other students at the university in Cougar Rx Corner in our newsletter. And I'm also uh, extremely proud to announce uh, beginning in March 2011 this year that uh, Lindy will begin a two-year term as our new president of the Parkinson's uh, Resource Board of Directors, uh, which we're extremely pleased and happy to have her uh, leadership and her talents uh, continue to help this organization grow and provide better services to all of you. So with that being said, uh, today's topic is take charge of your medications, how to empower yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, Josh Newmiller and Lindy Woodswing. All right, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you all for braving the cold weather to come today uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting us. And uh, as was mentioned, our topic today is to take charge of your medications, how to empower yourself. And uh, as was mentioned, uh, Lindy and I both work at Washington State University, so you might be wondering why we have this logo up here, Pharmacy Advocates. 
And I'll just point out quickly, and Lindy will talk about this towards the end of the presentation when she's talking about some potential resources you could look into. Uh, the two of us recently started a website that is this Pharmacy Advocates where we'll have some uh, tools that we're going to develop that might be uh, useful as you help manage your medications such as med lists, uh, et cetera. And I'll talk a little bit about that as I go through, but wanted to point out uh, why we had that there on our first slide. Okay, so first here, talk, when we talk about empowerment and really taking empowerment of your medications, uh, I'll talk about a few terms here first. And, what I've done is tried to highlight some of the, the key words in these definitions. So <laughs> empowerment, uh, to give power or authority to. And when we talk about really taking control of your medications, uh, it's really good if you yourself and your caregivers can really take authority over what medications you're taking. You all have fantastic physicians and other healthcare providers and supporters that really help you through uh, working with your medications. But really, when it comes down to it, some of those folks have limitations on their time and how much time they can spend with you. And really, uh, you can take really good control of your medicines. And really, you have the most vested interest in taking control of those medications and making sure they're doing the best they can for you uh, and as an individual. An advocate uh, or advocate can be a verb or a noun, as we as we noted here. So to advocate for an individual is to speak or write in favor of or to support. And I think support is the key word here, or urged by argument. And so we'll talk about really finding some advocates you can use to help you as you manage your medications, whether that be a pharmacist or some other trusted individual that you can field questions off of and, and really find out uh, and get answers to the questions you want to know. And then a noun, a person who speaks in support or defense, again, if that's an individual that, that can help you uh, in managing your medicines from day to day. So know your meds. I'm going to uh, read a quick little poem here from Dr. Seuss. Uh, so you're only old once is the title of this. And so this small white pill is what I munch at breakfast and right after lunch. I take the pill that's Kelly Green before each meal and in between. These Loganberry colored pills I take for early morning chills. I take the pill with zebra stripes to cure my early evening gripes. These orange tinted ones, of course, I take to cure my Charlie horse. I take three blues at half past eight to slow my exhalation rate. On alternate nights at 9 p.m., I swallow pinkies, four of them. The reds, which make my eyebrows strong, I eat like popcorn all day long. The speckled browns are what I keep beside my bed to help me sleep. And this long flat one is what I take if I should die before I wake. So do any of you have friends or, or family where you ask them about their medicines? And they say, well, I have this uh, green one I take. And have you ever had people who talk about their medicines like that? Sure. Uh, and we do some research through Washington State University. And, and one of our projects was actually looking at folks after they came out of the hospital. So they went into the hospital for whatever reason, an unfortunate event. And when they're... When they go into the hospital, sometimes they have to try to explain as best they can what medicines they take so that the hospital can give those to folks on a day-to-day -day basis. And during our study, we had actually kept a few hospital admission records uh, just as examples for some of our students that we show them. And I'll never forget one of them where I was reading the admission record and it was talking about how this individual had this unfortunate uh, heart condition and was being hospitalized to help manage that and uh, went to the admission medication list and it said white round pill twice a day, uh, oblong yellow pill three times a day, and it was listed just like that in the, in the medical record. And it's like, wow, what, what's the hospital gonna do with that, right? Um, so, so we point this out and then really, uh, what we really might like to encourage people to do is really know their medicines and, and try not to explain them as that, that round one or that oblong one or that colored one. That can be helpful in determining uh, some unknown medication, but really knowing the names of your medications and what they're for um, is ideal. So a quick example here. So has anybody, has anybody take a medication that looks like this? Does this look familiar to anybody? This is a Parkinson's medication. Maybe some of you have seen this in your, in your pill box. So this is a, a Stilevo, 150 milligrams. So uh, where somebody might say, uh, I take a, a football shaped brown pill. Might be, might be helpful if you really don't know the name of that medication, but does anybody think some problems could arise from describing your, your medicine as a football shaped brown pill? Maybe, right? So here's another one. Um, looks very similar. 
And this is actually a Stilevo as well. It's just a different dose of Stilevo. So uh, where you might say, well, Stilevo, they might figure out it's a Stilevo, but which dose is it? So you can't tell between the two medications just based on a description of the color and the shape of the pill. But where we can really run into problems is here we have another one that's football shaped and brown. Um, not a Stilevo, not even close. Uh, this is actually Acupro, which is a blood pressure medication. So obviously if we got those uh, confused when you're in the hospital, we could run into some problems, right? Especially if, if you happen to have problems with low blood pressure and you end up on a blood pressure medication mistakenly, uh, could run into some issues. So kind of a long-winded uh, example of why really knowing the names of your medications, et cetera, can be helpful when describing uh, what you take, especially in instances of emergency, such as going to the hospital. And Lindy's going to talk uh, uh, quite a bit about some of the some of the steps you can take to really be prepared uh, for the uh, unforeseen if you do end up at the hospital. So from here, we're going to go through several steps. There's actually six steps uh, that you can take to really make sure uh, you're you're empowered with your medications. You know what you're taking, and you can explain that to somebody. Um, if, if you do need to in, in any circumstance. So step one that we'll talk about are know your meds. Uh, so how many of you keep a list? Okay, so I see quite a lot of hands going up and that's fantastic and that's, that's really step one most important thing uh, we like people to do with their medications is keep a list. How many of you update it every time you take something new or a dose changes? Okay, great, see a lot of hands. And really that's where we see the most problem with uh, uh, people's uh, medication lists. A lot of people are very diligent at making a list and then something happens, they go into the hospital and, and they forgot to put that, that new herbal product they, they, they started or they changed their dose of their cinnamon and forgot to write that on the list and then you get into the hospital and they're just going to assume that's updated. When in, in some instances it may not. So here we have update in bold capital letters. So make sure you're updating that list and carrying it with you uh, in case you need it, because you really never know when, when the circumstance might come up. So some things to keep on a medication list, and uh, hopefully all of you who do have a medication list uh, have these components on it. So medication name, strength, and how much you take and how often. So all very important uh, things and components on a medication list. One of the things we really like to stress to people is make sure on your medication list you write what you actually do, not necessarily what's on that pill bottle, right? Uh, so many of you change your, how much medication you take or when you take it based on your symptoms. So that's what you want on your medication list, not necessarily uh, what is written on that prescription bottle. Um, at the, on the introductions, as mentioned, I work uh, quite a bit in diabetes, and I had a gentleman come in recently who was on insulin. I don't know if I have any insulin users in the audience, but he was having some trouble with his blood sugar going up and down, and he had recently gone in to see his uh, diabetes doctor or endocrinologist and said, well, my blood sugars are just out of control. And he was supposed to be on this uh, rapid acting insulin that he took with meals. And the endocrinologist made a bunch of adjustments and, and he came in and said, well, my, my blood sugars aren't any better. They're actually getting a little worse. And, and I, I asked, well, what kind of changes did they make? And he kind of went through them with me and I was like, well, wait a minute, according to our records, you're taking this insulin at this dose this many times a day. Did you express that to your doctor? And uh, because this was a change this individual had decided to make on her own, and she said, well, no, I, I didn't explain that. I didn't want the doctor to think I wasn't following his instructions. And so the, the doctor's basically making recommendations with a blindfold on. They need to know what you're doing. And the same really goes with the medication list, making sure it's what you're actually doing, uh, not what the doctor uh, uh, wrote on the prescription. <coughs> Why you take each medication um, is very important. Uh, sometimes there are medications that are used for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and if you put a medication on a list and don't put on there why you take it, people might make false assumptions as to what conditions you have or why you're taking a medication. So you guys are probably, well, many of you may take Mirapex for your Parkinson's disease. So that medication is also used for restless leg syndrome. So often if people see Mirapex on a medication list, they might say, well, this person must have Parkinson's disease. Not necessarily. They might be using it uh, for another condition. And there's quite a slew of medications that have that uh, uh, thing to consider that they can be used for a variety of different reasons. So write on that medication list why you take it if you can. 
who prescribes it. So has anybody in here seen more than one doctor? I'm sure quite a few do. Uh, you know, your primary doctor, your, your neurologist, maybe you have a cardiologist, and the list can go on and on. And uh, it's very important to, if you can, if you can make room on that medication list, just write who's prescribing that medication. If, if one of your doctors sees it and wants to make a change, it's very important. Uh, maybe sometimes they don't remember who, pers maybe they think they prescribed that, when in fact it was your cardiologist. Knowing that kind of information can be important uh, as medications are being adjusted by your doctors and other uh, folks working with you. So also list medication allergies and medications you have not tolerated or have stopped. So this is important as well. Um, I'm sure many of you in the audience have drug allergies or intolerances to medications. If you go into the hospital and present that medication list that you have with you, and you have that section at the bottom that says, I'm intolerant to these medications, uh, we, can, we can prevent you from receiving those in the hospital. And, and I think all of us uh, working, all of us pharmacists and our pharmacy students even have seen folks who've gone into the hospital and received medications that they shouldn't have just because their records are uh, not up to date with that kind of information. And another reason that's important is because maybe your recollection of a medication you took 20 years ago that you were allergic to, you remember the brand name of that medicine, and then when you go in the hospital, they're talking about drugs in terms of generic names. So maybe they'll say, we're going to give you this medication named meparidine, for example, and you don't recognize that that's Demerol that you're allergic to. So if you put that on the medication list, they'll be sure and get that in the records, and uh, proper uh, precautions can take place. And then here in bold, and I think we all forget this when we're working on our medication list, don't forget over-the-counter products, herbal supplements, because all of those are important. And, and while they're, they may be natural and over-the-counter and you can go buy them without a prescription, they can interact with your prescription medications in some instances. So that's uh, very important information for your doctors and other folks to know. I throw this up here just because this is, uh, I, I talked about some of the resources we were going to have on our website that Wendy uh, will, will provide you at the end of the talk. Uh, this is uh, one of those. This is a, a medication list that we developed that may or may not be useful uh, for those of you in the audience. And I believe there will be some handouts coming where we'll give you a, a hard copy of this uh, later today. But one of the comments we often get from uh, folks, say, using Cinemet, where you're using it every two, three hours a day in some instances, is when you use some of these printable medication lists, it's often not real feasible to write that in in these medication lists that say, you know, uh, morning, lunch, and dinner. Uh, that really doesn't capture what you do with your medicines. Uh, so what Lindy did on this particular medication list is really break it down into very specific time frames with multiple uh, spots you can indicate you're taking a medication. And uh, again, Lindy will give you the website where you can actually go and we have this as a Word document and you can fill in, type in all your medicines and print it out on your computer. So hopefully that's uh, useful uh, for some of you. So moving on, uh, step one, know your meds. And accuracy counts, and this is important. Uh, you know, these uh, micrograms, milligrams, grams, uh, that can be important for a lot of medications. So here we have one microgram versus one milligram. Really, when we're writing that on our list, uh, it's just a matter of including or forgetting that C there, but really we're looking at a thousand-fold difference in the dose. So details matter in making sure everything's very legible on that medication list. And then thinking about sound-alike or look-alike uh, medication. So here we have Allegra and Viagra, those, those sound alike, right? Um, do very different things, obviously, <laughs> wouldn't want to mix those up. And maybe one more uh, practical to the audience is Azelect and Aricept. Um, many folks could be using these together. Um, and then coming back to your medication list, if you're handwriting that, make sure it's very legible because uh, people seeing your medication list may expect one or the other or both of those medications. So make sure it's legible and then these get transferred appropriately to your physician's records or hospital records or what have you. Has anybody heard the word polypharmacy or been aware of that, that term, polypharmacy? It's one you may hear about, and there's really different people's perspectives on what polypharmacy means. And we have here beware of polypharmacy, but what does that mean? Often people say that means just poly, meaning many, pharmacy meds, so people on a lot of medications. And often uh, 
you know, a lot of people we see, they can be on quite a few medications. I saw uh, a nice woman uh, about a year ago was on 47 different medications that she was trying to manage herself. And uh, she didn't have a medication list, and we were trying to get her uh, to keep that updated, which would be um, a really involved process with all that medication. But really, that was the only way she could really keep tabs on that. And certainly, if she went into the hospital, she wouldn't be able to uh, recall all these medicines and all the doses she was on. But uh, that was a case of polypharmacy, many medications. Um, but the, the definition we like to use is medications without a clear indication. Okay, so somebody may be on five medicines and have polypharmacy because maybe they don't need one or two of those medicines. In that case, that would be polypharmacy because they're taking more than they really should. In contrast, we could have somebody <laughs> on 15 or 20 medicines, but those could be all very appropriate and needed. And so it, it's not necessarily the number, but when we talk about polypharmacy, just making sure everything you're taking has a place, has a use, and is appropriate. And that's really where these advocates or that trusted individual where you could bounce off your medication list periodically can really uh, uh, play a benefit in terms of reviewing your medicines and making sure everything has a role. So ask your doctor or pharmacist to help you make a list of all of your medicines if you don't already. And if you do have a medic uh, list, you know, update that, take it to one, one of your trusted pharmacists or other professionals and just have them take a look and make sure everything looks on the up and up. Which uh, moves us into step two here, know your pharmacist. Um, do, it, do many of you have pretty good relationships with your, your pharmacist you fill your medicines with? I see a lot of nods and some hands, so that's fantastic. Um, you, you know, you see them every month if you're filling your medications monthly. Uh, they're often very happy to answer your questions and really work through any problems you have. We talked about making sure those over-the-counter products and herbals are on your list. It's always good to ask that pharmacist, well, what do you think about this product? Does it interact with any of my drugs? You know, that's, that's what they're there for and they can be very helpful in that instance. Also, uh, very important in terms of knowing your pharmacist, if at all possible, fill all your medications at the same pharmacy. And when they fill a new medication for you, uh, their software will check it against what you're already on, looking for drug interactions and other pro problems that may arise. So go to the same pharmacist if you can and make sure you build a relationship uh, with that individual. So test for the group, and I think I've already uh, uh, alluded to this, so does natural equal safe? I see some no's. Anybody think there's a, that's a yes? No takers for yes. Okay, so there's a lot of products over the counter herbals that say, oh, it's it's all natural. Uh, we just like to make people make sure people know that doesn't mean it's safe. Uh, has anybody heard of a medication called Coumadin or Warfarin? Okay, so people with heart conditions and other otherwise may be on that. There are a lot of over the counter products that can interact with that and really. Um, affect the way that works in the body and we like to tell people that Coumadin interacts with air really anything you do dietary or medication wise can affect the way that medication works and it's certainly not uh, limited uh, to warfarin so even some of your other medications you take can be affected by these again even though they're available without a prescription so make sure you're running that by your neurologist or your pharmacist or, or whoever uh, you you like to talk to about such issues so the answer no, uh, always ask your pharmacist before starting any OTC or herbal products. And so another point here, so any symptom, and this is from a physician, Michael Steineman, any symptom in an older adult should be considered a drug side effect until proven otherwise. Uh, and this is what this individual really believes. And when you're starting a new medication, um, if you do have a side effect, make sure you report that to your doctor or your pharmacist. Um, any little, any little symptom or something new, it's important to report that because that very well could be due to your medication no matter how uh, minor or uh, just a little bit of an inconvenience it could be. Uh, is anybody on a medication called lisinopril or uh, you know that, that other football shaped drug I had on that first slide was acupril. That's a medication in a class called ACE inhibitors. Well these medications can cause a dry cough in folks. And it's not uncommon for us to see people and we'll, we'll review their medication list and they're on a, a cough suppressant. And we, oh, well, are you sick? And they'll say, well, no, I've had this dry cough for two months. I'm trying all this over-the-counter products and they think I have 
you know, something going on, a little chest cold, and, and we, lo and behold, we go back and look, and they started this medication lisinopril two months ago, and they didn't think that that would be a medication side effect, when in fact it's uh, relatively common for that class of medications, and all they have to do is essentially s switch you over to another one that's similar. So again, any, any symptom you come up with after starting a medication, it never hurts to ask, could this be due to this new drug? So here we have a, a term, uh, medication checkup. So this is something we, we like to talk about in terms of empowering uh, yourself and your medicine. So everybody goes to their doctors for checkups, um, and, and often your neurologist will look at your, your medications for your Parkinson's and, and maybe some of your other conditions. If you have a diabetes doctor, they'll look at your diabetes meds and, and make adjustments. But often uh, people don't take a look at the big picture and look at all those medications. And we really uh, encourage people to get what we term a medication checkup. Just go to have a pharmacist or some other person look at all your meds just to make sure everything looks okay. Look at additions, subtractions from your medication list since the last time they visited with you. Just as kind of a reassurance that your medications are all working well uh, together. Um, a pharmacist uh, specifically, and, and we're biased of course because we're a couple pharmacists up here talking to you today, but they can check for it, drug interactions as I mentioned. Uh, side effects of your medications, especially if you do have new things come about when you start a new medication. Cost-saving alternatives, um, and this is something we help people with from time to time. They're on a number of uh, brand medications. Pharmacists may be able to point something out to you that's available generic or very similar where you might have less out-of-pocket pocket expense with your medicines. So that's another service pharmacists can provide. Uh, ways to reduce the number of meds you take. There are combination pills out there for some of the uh, various medications that are often taken together. Maybe strategies whereby you can take less medications if you are one of those uh, people that really uh, take a, a handful of pills with every meal, which some folks unfortunately do. And then just to make sure uh, doses are correct and appropriate and, and just take a good look at everything. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Lindy and then we'll uh, end at the end for questions. maybe take the doctor's advice, do what they say, and if you're like most people, you maybe get a good 15 minutes with the doctor, and sometimes that's not enough time to get all of your questions answered. So we have a little set of questions that we would recommend that you ask before you take any new uh, prescription, or OTC for that matter. The first is, why am I taking this? Uh, you might be surprised at the number of people we talk to who actually have no idea why they're taking a lot of their medications. So just going back to what Dr. Newmiller was speaking of, it's very important to note the reason that you take a medication on your pill list and then also ask if there's a doctor prescribing you a new medication say you know what is this for what am I going to expect with this medication um, number two is ask what is the brand and generic name I think it's a good idea to ask a doctor to write down both of those names for you so that you can look at that it can get very confusing uh, Josh mentioned the example of you know an allergy to meparidine uh, but you know it as Demerol, and that can be a huge safety issue. Uh, for example, we've had patients who they go to their doctor and get a prescription from their kidney doctor for a medication called Lasix, which is a water pill. It helps you remove fluid. Well, they get that filled and then they go home, not realizing that Lasix is also called furosemide. And maybe they had some furosemide at home that they take when needed that was given to them by their primary care provider. If you end up taking both, you can actually get rid of too much fluid and that can cause you know, severe dehydration and health problems there. So it's a good idea to ask your doctor to note both the brand and generic for you. And then ask the pharmacist about that too when you're filling it. A lot of places are pretty good. They'll put both names on the prescription, but some of them don't. Number three is a big one. What should I expect? You know, how long is this medication going to take to work? Uh, if we're giving you a thyroid supplement because your thyroid's not producing enough in your body, it actually might take a month or even two months to get working versus if I give you a sleep aid, I'm hoping that it's gonna start working within that first dose. So it's always a good idea to know what can I expect? How do I know if this is working? Also, how do I take this medication? Um, with food, without food, that's always good to know. 
Uh, just as a side note, um, a lot of people ask me about the medication Azelect and taking that medication with tyramine containing foods. How many of you have heard warnings about Azelect and tyramine foods? Okay. And I just want to note that that um, labeling in the Azelect, I mean, the manufacturer has actually done studies on that, and the tyramine is not necessarily an issue anymore. They've done studies to show that you can consume tyramine containing foods. Those are things like cheese, beer, wine, aged meats, the, the wonderful things in life. Um, so the manufacturer has shown that it is safe to consume those foods. Um, there are a couple certain types of cheeses that contain excessive amounts of tyramine that they recommend you stay away from, but I still get a lot of questions about that, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, what are the side effects of the medication? That's a big one that you do need to ask. Um, you might get the little pamphlet from the pharmacy, and if you read that, um, it might scare you out of taking the drug altogether. The list of side effects is about a mile long, so it's really hard to tease out, okay, what can I expect? So I would recommend that you talk to the doctor and the pharmacist and say, what are the common side effects? What can I expect? What is a dangerous side effect that I need to report to you? And then also, what do I do if I get a side effect? For those of you that have taken Mirapex or Requip, you might have gotten a little bit nauseous when you first took that medication. Well, it's a good idea to know that, okay, I can take it with food. Maybe if I take it at night, that can help. With some crackers, maybe taking some ginger tea can help. All of those things. Unfortunately, we meet a lot of people who have side effects, they don't know what to do, and then they just stop the medication. And then now they've eliminated a perfectly good medication that may have worked well for them. So always be prepared. It's better to know the side effects than to be ignorant of them. And then number four, is this something that I'm going to take short term or long term? In medicine, we're very good at starting medications. Uh, sometimes we forget to stop them, however. Um, so you might take, you know, an antibiotic for a couple weeks and you might take certain pills. Some people take blood pressure pills for the rest of their life. Um, unfortunately, sometimes things get started and then they never get reevaluated. Uh, for example, we see a lot of people who do come out of the hospital. And when you're in the hospital, a lot of times you seem to have a little bit of excessive stomach acid. So people will start medications like Prilosec. They help suppress stomach acid. Well, then you go home and you go back to your primary care doctor, and maybe he or she doesn't even know that was added. So it might be something you might not need long term. So just always asking your doctor, do you expect me to be on this for a long time, or is this a short term therapy? Here's a little cartoon. It's um, a doctor saying, listen, when the side effects of this medication kick in, you'll forget what was wrong in the first place. So. Um, this is, you know, meant as a joke, but it's also true. There's certainly tolerable side effects that go away, but then there can be intolerable side effects. And as Josh mentioned, it's important to mention side effects to your doctor. However, do be aware that sometimes if a doctor or other healthcare professional doesn't recognize that it's a side effect, you might end up with a prescription for something else. Like that example he cited, you know, if you report a dry hacking cough to a doctor, they might think, oh, well that sort of sounds like you have a little bronchitis or pneumonia and all of a sudden you've got an antibiotic. We call that in pharmacy the prescribing cascade where drugs are prescribed for side effects of other drugs. Sometimes that's necessary if the drug is important enough that you take it. Other times that definitely goes down a bad path that we want to avoid. Continuing on with step three of asking questions. Do your research on supplements that you choose to take. If I entered into Google supplements for Parkinson's, I guarantee I can probably find about a million websites that are going to sell you the cure for Parkinson's. So first of all, be leery of websites that are touting uh, various you know, nutrition products, but then also selling you that product. Sometimes their intentions aren't exactly pure. As far as looking for an appropriate over-the-counter agent, that seal that you see there, the USP seal, is very important to look for. That stands for United States Pharmacopeia. And what that is, is an independent lab who has actually tested products to make sure that one, they contain what they say they do, two, they contain it in the right amount, and three, they don't contain any contaminants that they shouldn't. Over-the-counter drugs are not regulated the same way that prescription products are, and so they are not tested. I can throw anything in a bottle and sell it to you. So it's very important to look for that seal. Another website is consumerlabs.com. 
They actually do some independent testing, but they do actually require payment for that to read their reports. Um, just as a note, one of the really good brands that does have their products tested is actually the Kirkland Signature brand. So Costco is a good place to buy your vitamins. Nature Made is another one. The Shift brand has all of their things tested. And at the end of the presentation, we'll give you um, some references to go so you can check your supplements. The second point here is if your med ever looks different, ask about it. I would recommend that when you go to the pharmacy and pick up your medications, you actually open up that bottle and look at your medications to make sure that it looks the same. Uh, sometimes it will change, and there's a reason for that. Uh, there can be many different manufacturers of certain generic medications, and so a pharmacy may get different products in from different manufacturers, and that's okay. But if your med ever looks different and no one's told you that it should look different, that's a big warning sign. There's actually been quite a few pharmacy errors with the drug Cinemet, Carbidopa, Levodopa. Those of you that take Cinemet probably know that it comes in a variety of formulations. There's an immediate release, there's a controlled release, there's a dissolvable tablet, there's 25100, 25250, all kinds of strengths. So unfortunately, pharmacists and pharmacies aren't perfect and they do make errors. So always look at those pills and make sure that it looks like what it's supposed to look like. As another side note, you might have heard that there's some news reports about there being a Cinemet shortage. Um, this has been going on in Europe for some time, and then on Friday, the National Parkinson's Foundation uh, announced a little blurb from Merck that they do anticipate a potential shortage of Cinemet in the US. Uh, the good news here is that that is only for the brand name products. So brand name Cinemet and brand name Cinemet Control Release. Those of you that take generic products should not be affected by this. If you do take a brand name product, the good news is we can switch you to a generic product. Um, for Cinemet, it's one of those drugs that it can be a little bit different going from brand to brand. So if you do have to switch, we might have to do a little tinkering with your dose. But rest assured that there's not going to be no Cinemet out there. It's just the branded product. Step four, one at a time. If you've ever seen the movie, What About Bob? Uh, you might recognize the mantra, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. Um, and we like this in pharmacy. Even though politicians <coughs> like the word change and they want a lot of change all at once, we like one change at a time, slowly and methodically. Um, in general, medications, uh, it's not good to make a lot of changes at once, whether that's starting a lot of medications or stopping a lot of medications. One at a time allows you to actually see what the effect of a change is. Additionally, a lot of medications we actually slowly start you on and increase the dose with time, and those medications, it's a good idea to slowly wean you off of them. So never start or stop anything abruptly on your own because a lot of things do have to be stopped slowly. I met one patient who, as I mentioned, I'll ask, you know, why are you taking this and they don't know. I had one lady who was taking something for some muscle spasms in her neck, and I said, oh good, you know, does that work for you? She said, well, I don't know. I've just taken it for so long, I don't know if it works. So we decided with her doctor, why don't we try to take this away and see if it was actually doing you any good? So we took it away, and it turned out she didn't really need it. It didn't have much of an effect for her. Um, and the good news is, for most things, if we take them away, you haven't lost anything, and we can always add it back. So. To a certain extent, there's a degree of experimentation here, but we definitely like one change at a time so we can actually see the effect of that change. <coughs> Step five, non-pill solutions. So you think that you know we as pharmacists, we have a pill for everything, right? We can cure it with a pill. Um, well, that's not necessarily the approach that we like to take. Most of our clients that we meet are not wanting us to add more pills to their regimen. They're usually asking us, how can I get rid of some of these pills? So definitely looking at some non-drug solutions is very important. Before your doctor hands you that prescription, say, wait a second, is there anything I can do that's not a prescription before I have to go that route? Um, you hear the commercials that, you know, these days for medications, and at the beginning of them you think, wow, that sounds great. You know, I have that disease, and I need that. And then do you notice at the end of the commercial that the text gets really small at the bottom and all of a sudden the voice speeds up. This may cause hallucinations, gambling, you know, all kinds of different issues. So they tend to gloss over that. So the nice thing is a lot of non-drug solutions don't have side effects. Uh, one example here is 
uh, oftentimes in Parkinson's and also people that have dementia, like Alzheimer's dementia, they, um, in advanced situations, may lose weight and not really want to eat, not have much of an appetite. But we do have a medication for that. And so that's great, you know, just take a pill, gain some weight. Well, it has a lot of side effects, including confusion, erratic heartbeats, uh, water retention, nausea, hair loss. Uh, so that's not exactly great. But what if I told you all you had to do was think about switching out the color of your plates? Um, there have been some studies with people with Alzheimer's where they found that them eating off of white plates, you know, maybe chicken and rice on a white plate isn't very exciting. But if you gave them a red plate, all of a sudden there's some more contrast and people were actually eating more. So it's always important to explore non-medication solutions. Along that line, uh, I have a little question for the group. What's the best way to improve balance problems if you have Parkinson's? A is to take your Cinemet, your Carbidopa, Levodopa. B would be to take the supplement Coenzyme Q10. C is exercise and physical therapy. And D is just avoid standing up so you don't get off balance. So I'm hearing a lot of C. Yeah, that's definitely what we feel. Um, even as a pharmacist where I believe drugs are crucially important in the treatment of Parkinson's, I actually believe that if you have Parkinson's, the best thing you can do for yourself is to exercise. The studies and the research that's coming out on this are just phenomenal with everything from the dancing to tandem bicycling to even boxing. Um, hopefully not contact boxing, but um, just kickboxing and you know punching bags and things like that uh, show how important exercise is. So we often refer to nutritionists speech therapists, occupational therapists, and physical therapists to really get the whole spectrum of care. If you rely on medications alone, you're really doing yourself a big disservice. Step six we borrowed from the Boy Scouts, and that's to be prepared. We know that emergencies and hospital visits do happen, so the best thing to do is to be prepared for those. Many people that we have met with Parkinson's do not enjoy going to the hospital or the emergency room. Most people in general don't, but especially in Parkinson's because hospitals and the way that they do medications don't usually work as well with the way that your bodies might work and need your medications. And sometimes the medications that you take aren't available at the hospital. It's not their fault. They don't see that many people with Parkinson's and so they might not have the experience. But it's hugely important to, again, have that medication list, distribute it to all your healthcare providers, and then also to a loved one that can advocate for you. Having that advocate in you, with you in the hospital is very important. Being persistent about your medications. So, you know, be the squeaky wheel if you have to go to the hospital. Remind them that, hey, I need my Cinemet at, you know, 8.30 a.m. Showing them the importance of that. Many nurses may not realize that, you know, it's that important for you to get your medications on time. People that take blood pressure pills, it may not be a big deal if they have to wait five hours for their blood pressure pill. With Parkinson's, that's not the story. So explain to them how important it is for your movement that you absolutely get your meds when you need them. And then before you go home from the hospital, ask them to go over the medication list that you brought in and the one you're leaving on. If you've ever left the hospital, you know that discharge paperwork from the hospital is about the com most confusing thing you can see. Even for a pharmacist, when I look at people's discharge paperwork, it takes me a while to figure out what the heck they're supposed to be taking after a hospitalization. There tend to be a lot of changes. So asking them to compare those lists and say, what did you change? What am I doing different? Along the lines of be prepared, this is a little bit facetious, but um, everyone is unfortunately going to die. We have a lot of modern medicine and miracles, but science has not achieved a way for us to live forever. So we definitely advocate that although it can be unpleasant, it's critically important to talk to your family about your wishes. What interventions do you want? What do you not want? Um, and aging with dignity is a society that has actually created something called the five wishes. And that's another link that we'll give you. That is actually a, a paperwork that you fill out. It's actually a legal form, so it's, it works as a power of attorney, a living will, where you designate someone to be your advocate, and then you go into what types of interventions you want, things like feeding tubes, antibiotics, all of those things that medicine can intervene on, and you can choose what you want. That's just important. Uh, people of all ages should fill that out so that your family 
in a tough time is not having to make those decisions for you rather than know what you want. So lastly, we do have some resources for you that I've alluded to. Um, the Parkinson's Resource Center of Spokane. If you visited our website in the last couple of days, you'll see that we're undergoing some changes. We're updating the website and making it a little bit more interactive with a blog. Um, as far as those supplements that I mentioned, finding supplements that are checked by the USP, there's a link there, or you can just put into Google USP Verified Supplements, and it'll take you to that page. I mentioned some of the brands, but Kirkland Signature, Nature Made, Sunmark, a lot of the actual drugstore brands have been verified, so you don't necessarily have to spend a bunch of money on the really expensive brand name products. Pharmacy Advocates, that's the site that Josh mentioned that we've started. We put information on there um, about medication management, Parkinson's, and we do have a link to that med list that he showed, and we have it where you can download the med list and then type in your medications and update that. Also, the Northwest uh, Parkinson's Foundation, they have a phenomenal uh, wellness website that goes into a lot of the non-drug things, um, exercise, nutrition, things like that. And then lastly, those five wishes that I spoke of, um, that's at the Aging with Dignity website. So in conclusion, uh, growing old is not for sissies, um, but you can do it with dignity and wellness. So with that, we're ready to open it up to questions. Thank you, Josh and Wendy. Um, excellent practical information that I think whether you have Parkinson's or not, that all of us can be reminded of and use each and every day to help us be more prepared. So these tips that they give you, uh, hope that they have a chance to write them down, such as ask questions, be prepared, know your meds, things of that nature are all very important for all of us. So I'll ask the remote sites, if you would, to please open up your microphones, uh, and I'll call each uh, site, as we always have, uh, individually. Uh, we got a little bit shorter list today, I think mostly because of the weather, but uh, uh, if you have any questions, do speak up, and if we go past you, a uh, remote site, you can always come back and uh, ask a, a question, okay? So let's start with our friends in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, any questions uh, from you folks? Yes, uh, my name's Larry, and I uh, am a private pilot, and I basically, I've been taking ASLAC and feel like I continue that, but the FAA says that's not uh, it's not acceptable. But I, I read something recently that maybe they were under us uh, study for that still, the FAA was still evaluating that. Does anybody know anything about that? So the question was um, from a pilot who takes Azelect, but the FAA doesn't allow Azelect. Um, I have not heard about that. Um, Azelect from most people that I meet doesn't tend to cause um, a ton of sleepiness. Um, usually it's the dopamine agonists like Requip and Mirapex and then also Cinemed uh, can certainly cause quite a bit of drowsiness. Um, I'm not aware of anything with that that they're reviewing that, but I would certainly, you know, check into that and I don't know if there's a way to protest that, but ask because uh, Sleepiness isn't usually one of its huge side effects. The Cinemet, they said, was okay, but uh, the Azelac, uh, <laughs> was I, one of those had some, something about a lot of heart pounding, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that was Azelac, but I think so. Okay. Yeah, I don't know about that specific case with the, the FAA, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Anchorage? Okay, thank you so uh, much. I, 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 yeah, please. I do have another one. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, about taking Cinemet. Uh, it seems that, I don't know if this was other pills, but it seems like it doesn't actually go down it, uh, through the esophagus all the way. Uh, and that seems to make me feel more nauseous. Uh, Look that up and, or uh, something to take that with. Uh, sure. The, the question was about taking Cinemet and it kind of, you know, catching in the esophagus and not going down all the way. Um, we definitely always recommend that you take all of your pills with a nice full glass of water, take one at a time, 
It might help if you maybe chase it, so to speak, with a little applesauce or something like that, um, just to help work it. And the best thing would be to take some water with it and t take your pills one at a time, because sometimes when you take a big handful of them, uh, they might stick a little bit more. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Walla Walla, Providence St. Mary's Medical Center. Uh, any questions, folks? No questions. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Tenasket, North Valley Hospital. Speaking of leftover bits and pieces of medications, um, I've been trying to figure out an ecologically sound and safe way of disposing of old medications. And what are you recommending now, now that we know that flushing it down the drain, <coughs> down the toilet is um, caustic and <laughs> ecologically horrible? Yeah, uh, we don't recommend dissolving, you know, getting rid of medications down the drain. Um, but what you can do in Spokane is actually put it in your garbage. Um, and that's what is typically recommended here, is actually to just put it in your garbage. To go in the, to go in the landfills? I think, Incinerators. yeah, a lot of it is incinerated here in Spokane, so oh. they will actually burn. Um, Thank you. Did you have something to add to that? <laughs> well, I was taught you put it in the coffee grind. Oh, coffee and, grounds. Yeah, the coffee grounds after the yeah, or cat litter. Yeah, if you're ever concerned, like about someone getting into your garbage, um, like some people that maybe have, you know, narcotics for pain or things like that, what you can do is put it in your coffee grounds, mix it in there, or kitty litter, um, and that can definitely deter anyone from getting getting into it, and then also help, you know, sort of dissolve it a little bit more. I never thought of that issue. I have a question about: Can you take it to your local pharmacy, and, and will they make it go away? Uh, most of them do not. Um, they actually, just because of uh, cost of disposal and things, they, they don't recommend that. But uh, may, maybe some of the independents would do that for you, I'm not yeah. sure. I think Group Health might have a disposal site, um, but do. I'm not sure on that. They do, Lindy. Okay. Yeah, Judy was saying they do. So um, Group Health might be a good place take to take them. them. If you have medications that are still packaged, for example, if you use insulin and it's still in the vial and you've never opened them, there are some places to donate them. I believe Crisis Clinic um, will sometimes take things like that. But once you have something that's in a, a bottle and it's been opened, unfortunately, it's a big liability for anyone to you know take that back. I have a... Uh... <coughs> Two questions. First one's probably pretty easy. Is there a way we can get a list of all them websites that you displayed up there? Definitely. Um, I think that, did you bring the handouts for this? Yeah. There are handouts here, and that should have our whole presentation as well as the, the list of websites for you. And the, the, the information should be on the website. Okay. And the information will be on the Spokane Parkinson's website as well. Another question is, I'm on Carbidolo, Libidolo, the settlement, and Azalec. But during the day, when I have to do something really tedious, or I might become a little emotional, I notice that, that my uh, tremors comes back. And I don't know if I'm on enough, or if I need adjustment made in my dosages, or is that just something that, that I have to deal with that's going to be there anyway? Uh, that's a good question. The question was about taking Cinemet and Azelect, and then you know working on something tedious, and some tremors come back. Um, I, I do think that's fairly common for people, you know, kind of breakthrough tremor if you're really focusing on something that that will come through. Um, but maybe we can talk to you one on one afterwards too and kind of look at if there's a pattern to that. If it's always at a certain time of day, then that might mean that maybe earlier you need a little bit more. So there might be some adjustments that you can make around that. One other um, quick point I wanted to reinforce. Earlier, uh, Dr. Newmiller mentioned the important point about uh, reporting side effects. Uh, perhaps the medication you're taking all of a sudden you feel differently, things like that that you might want to report to your doctor or your pharmacist. Uh, a little reminder behind that too is uh, if you can, always have the medication with you, uh, the name, the dose, all that type of information that they also talked about, writing everything down. 
because uh, that can be very valuable when that information is reported up through the system, meaning eventually back even to the pharmaceutical companies, uh, because sometimes there's bad lots that are produced. Uh, you know, there's a whole slew of different reasons why that information is very important. So I just also reinforce that you have that information available, whether you're talking to your doctor or pharmacist, because that can make a difference in the outcome of what comes of it, okay? Thanks. And one thing that uh, Josh reminded me that I forgot to talk about was um, when I was talking about the hospital visits for people with Parkinson's, we did want to let you know that um, here in Spokane, we are doing some research on that through WSU um, at Sacred Heart and with Dr. Jonathan Carlson, the neurosurgeon that does a lot of deep brain stimulation surgery. So uh, we're looking at ways that we can improve uh, medication administration and timeliness uh, to people with Parkinson's. So hopefully we'll see some improvements in that arena. I have a question from Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene, uh, you no. can call in. We have a question. Okay, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, I'm a fairly new patient with uh, Parkinson's, and I was issued a Parkinson's disease handbook. I'm a little confused because I'm on a dopamine agonist, Mirapex, and in the readings of the book, it says that their problems may be worsened by antiparkinson's medications. So they're recommending a reduction and elimination of dopamine agonist products because it causes dementia, and that's the Parkinson's Disease Handbook of 2009. Do you have any comments about that? It seems confusing to me why they're recommending reduction and elimination of dopamine agonists due to the dementia. Uh, they say it makes dementia worse. Oh, okay. So the, the question is referring to the Parkinson's Disease Handbook. Is that the one with the red cover on it? That, is it it's from blue and white. Oh, okay. It's put, put out by the American Parkinson's Disease Association 2009. It's called Parkinson's Disease Handbook. Okay. I'm not as familiar um, with that book, but I um, believe your question is about dopamine agonists and stopping them in, in light of dementia. So normally, if dementia does develop with Parkinson's disease, it's something that does happen much later in the course of the disease. And so usually most people um, getting to that point are going to be primarily maintained on Cinemet um, rather than a dopamine agonist. Dopamine agonists do cause some side effects in some people and can cause some trouble thinking in some people. They can also cause some hallucinations. So. If someone gets to the point where they're experiencing any dementia, we usually try to maintain them only on Cinemet and rather than, you know, have a bunch of different medications. Does that answer your question? question. Uh, so what you're saying is as dementia develops, then you would respond to it. It's not like to be proactive and get rid of the agonist before you start to see dementia occurring. Right, right. Yeah, we don't, you know, necessarily say don't take a dopamine agonist because you might develop dementia later. It's more that if we start to see troubles with thinking, we will think about scaling back on the agonist and using carbidopa, levodopa instead. Okay, the other one rather real quick question is uh, relates, it's from the same handbook. It talks about initial treatment of early disease. They recommend that you not start any drugs. They say experts would agree until you experience some functional disability from the disease. And they, so they're saying not to start any drugs until you actually have a functional disability. Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, the question was about starting a drug early on in Parkinson's and the handbook that he has uh, states that you should wait until there's actually a functional disability and you need the drug. Um, there's sort of two schools of thought on that. One school of thought is that, that you know, no drug until you absolutely need it. I'd say that's sort of changed in the last couple of years. And the new school of thought is that most people um, will start drug earlier, um, just in hopes to sort of give your brain a break from trying to fight the disease so much and give you something. Um, different doctors will take different approaches. So there's not necessarily a right answer. Um, and then the drug that is chosen is usually chosen based on the level of symptom control that you need. So if you don't have very many symptoms, a doctor might start something like Azelect. If you have some symptoms, they might start you on a dopamine agonist like Mirapex or Requip, but our absolute best drug for Parkinson's is Cinemet. So um, if you ever get to the point where you, know, you need that 
cinnamon, the carbidopa, levodopa, then that's what we reach for. So it's that's a little bit more of a controversial area. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Another question here? Yeah, I've not heard anything about uh, the use of caffeine in general or alcohol uh, or for that matter tobacco. And I just wonder whether, you know, if I were to start a sentence that said never or always with respect to those three general okay. drugs, can you finish the sentence? Okay. So he's asking about alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine. Um, as far as if I was going to start a sentence with never or always, I'd say always use in moderation um, any of those things. That's probably my theory on that. Um, you would agree. Um, uh, well, as far as nicotine and tobacco in general, you know, we're not big fans of smoking and tobacco use because of the, the health consequences of that. Um, as far as caffeine, um, caffeine is a drug, and I certainly see it having a role for some people that maybe are very sleepy. Um, it can help, you know, pep them up. It can also help some of your drugs to actually absorb a little bit faster for some people. Um, and then as far as alcohol, a lot of the medications say, you know, don't take this with alcohol. Um, you know, the occasional martini or beer here and there is probably not a huge concern. It's just important to be aware that alcohol can cause dizziness and changes in thought, and so it can cause sleepiness and all of those sort of things. So if you're going to be drinking alcohol, it can increase your risk of falls and side effects. Uh, just a comment on one uh, potential um, non-medication approach. Uh, in today's uh, newspaper, the local newspaper in Spokane, uh, there was a uh, report of a uh, small study that showed that listening to music resulted in a release of dopamine. And uh, um, I, this is something that the local Tremble Cliffs have found out and known for some time now. <laughs> I just want to remind folks that the Tremble Cliffs will be meeting again tomorrow. They meet every Tuesday at Rockwood South. At one o'clock, if you would like to, to join the group, uh, feel free. And you can also check us out. We now have a uh, Facebook page as well, so you can look up Tremble Quest Facebook page. And you don't have to sing loud. And you don't have to sing well; just sing loud. Very good. Strengthen Thanks. your voice. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Question here in Janaska. Yes, please. Um, been bothered by the gentleman from Anchorage. He would check with his AME or the FAA could be your best friend or your worst enemy. But he go talk to the uh, aviation medical examiner down in Anchorage. I think they might be able to help a little bit on that. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, please join me in uh, a round of thanks, uh, appreciation for Drs. Newmiller and, and Woods White. Now, it, as is tradition, our mascot, uh, Parky the Penguin, who everybody is very familiar with here in the Spokane area, uh, we always give one of these to our speakers. Uh, Lenny probably have about 20 of these, but, but anyway, thank you oh, so much. Thank you. But you can have one. <laughs> okay, uh, just a last couple of announcements, please. Um, our next jail health uh, is on Monday, February the 14th. Uh, the subject is, uh, well, the speaker is Barton uh, Bocook. You've probably heard of this person's name. Uh, and he's going to talk about gamma knife for Parkinson's tremor when DBS or deep brain stimulation is not an option. So we'll look forward to that on the 14th of February. Uh, and again, as always, if you want the DVD of this uh, program today, you can certainly contact the PRC at 509-473-2490 uh, or go to our website at www.spokaneparkinsons.org. Okay? Thank you again, everybody, and certainly all our uh, participants and sponsors, and uh, have a wonderful day. And please drive safe.